Now to an astonishing medical breakthrough. My next guest tonight is helping to diagnose early cases of Parkinson's disease through smell. Joy Mill has a condition known as hyperosmia, an incredibly hypersensitive sense of smell, and she is using it to help scientists sniff out the disease. Well, I'm very glad to say that Joy joins me now, as does Professor Padita Barrent from the University of Manchester, uh, the two ladies working together uh, on this breakthrough. And thank you so much for joining me. And Joy, did I pronounce hyperosmia right? Oh, yes, it's hyperosmia. Yeah. Hyperosmia, yes, it is. Um, a very rare condition, and you have it, this hypersensitive um, sense of smell. It's worth talking to us about how all of this came about, because you notice a change of smell in your husband. We all know the scent of our partners, but in particular, you, with your very strong sense of smell, noticed a change. Yes, well, uh, when you know, you're saying to your husband, well, you're smelling, you're not having enough showers, and... Um, well, you're not brushing your teeth enough and various other things. I mean, it doesn't go down well to start off with, does it? <laughs> sure it doesn't. <laughs> and uh, we continued like that for a while. And then I thought, yeah. I've got to stop this. He's not terribly pleased. I'll just have to keep quiet. He knew I had hyperosmia. He knew I could smell things. Um, and because we'd met when we were 16, it was quite a, a, you know, a thing between us that uh, he was very careful. He didn't wear um, any perfume scent or anything like that. Um, so, but it was about when he was 29, there was a definite change, a very distinct change. And by the time he was 31, his smell had completely changed. Mm. And, but various things began to happen and I thought he maybe had a brain tumour. So like many, and that's the case, uh, go off to see your GP and you end up at a neurologist, but the neurologist um, did um, diagnose Parkinson's. You knew you had to do something with this. You, you needed to be taken seriously. So, so you found a, a biologist that you wanted to get in front of when you went to a conference and literally put your hand up in the audience, didn't you? Yes. And how, how were you taken seriously? Because this is something, using smell to diagnose conditions or diseases, wasn't really being talked about at that time. Well, Professor Tilo Kunath was very much involved with Parkinson's. And mm. I had gone into the Parkinson's, uh, Parkinson's meeting in Perth, and by the time I left, I could tell you who had Parkinson's, who didn't, and who didn't. Now, there were over 30 people there, mm. and you know, I, I was quite able to do it. Then, um, Les, being a doctor, he realised what it meant. And we sat down as a doctor and nurse and discussed it, and he looked at the people who were doing talks, and, um, yes, he chose Tilo. And much to Tilo's surprise, I stood up at the end of his stem cell lecture and said, well, why are you not using the smell of Parkinson's to diagnose it earlier? Um, he was quite taken aback. And that's how the conversation began. Professor Barron, uh, you've both been working together for some time now to try and utilise this in diagnosing Parkinson's and the hope is perhaps other conditions and diseases. Tell us about the work that you've been doing and what point you've reached. So the first thing we wanted to do was to see if Joy was telling uh, telling the truth, whether she, whether she really could do it. So we had to do an experiment, which Tilo Kunath and I devised, which was to separate the obvious movement symptoms of people with Parkinson's disease from the smell. So we made some people wear T-shirts, and then we T-shirts were put in bags, and the, the T-shirts were then given to Joy. Okay, so now there's no obvious relationship to yeah. anyone who has a disease. And Joy was 100% correct in smelling the T-shirts and diagnosing from a T-shirt whether someone had Parkinson's or not. So that was the first incredible step change because it actually meant we could diagnose someone from, well, from material that they were wearing, from, from clothes. So we T-shirts are okay to work with, but we now, instead of using T-shirts, we use gauze or just Q-tips. And we, mm. the other really remarkable thing was where the smell was strongest. We thought it would be in the armpits. You mm. kind of would, wouldn't you? But it wasn't. It was in the middle of the back and underneath the hairline. 
So we now swab from people's backs, or, or people can do it at home and get a get a carer or, a, or a, a relative to do it for them. And they post those swabs to us. And then we use a method called mass spectrometry, which is a, mo- a method that weighs molecules. And that helps us to find out what they are. And we've worked, the, the image you just showed is Joy Milne, a, um, I'm not going to say her age, but a grandmother from Perth, <laughs> sitting at a mass spectrometer. And what she's doing is, as the molecules are being identified by the machine, she's also smelling them. So we split them. Some go to be weighed and some go to Joy's nose. And that allows us to code, to find out which of the very complicated mixture of molecules we have on our skin from skin swabs are to do with the disease, uh, are the ones that smell of it. This is remarkable. So you're replicating Joy's sense of smell. Um, Joy, how does it how does it feel to live with this? Because this is a blessing. You know, Professor Barron said there said, you know, in the beginning they didn't know whether to believe you, which I I, I know you, you corrected yourself, but you know, this is the stuff of tall tales, yet it is now grounded in science. But what's it like to live with this? Because you must walk past people on the street and be able to smell if they're carrying a condition that may, they may not be aware of. And ethically, I would imagine, that's quite difficult to carry on walking by. It is very difficult, but yeah. I have uh, signed a, disclo- a non-disclosure because it is unethical. It yeah. is unethical. I can't do anything about that. But I that. just wonder how that burden sits with you, because like I said, it's, it's such a blessing to have what you have, but also it must be extremely difficult. I think um, because it's a genetic thing in the female side of the family, my grandmother did warn me when she trained me. She did warn me not Mm. to use it. She said I would find it very difficult Mm. unless I made the decision that I would go ahead and do it. And I have made that choice. Um, I was a nurse, a carer for my mother-in-law and my husband with Parkinson's. And really, it is the right choice. I think it is the right choice. Yeah, and it's an incredible thing to do in your husband Les's memory as well. He, you know, wanted you to to put this to good use, and you certainly are. And ladies, thank you so much for coming on uh, to talk to us about it. Joy Milne and Professor Perdita Barron there. Uh, really good to to bring this story to people this evening. Some really uh, welcome good news. Thank you. Pleasure.